Today I have good news. We can finally lay to rest the idea that our universe is somehow especially hospitable for life. It just isn't. I think it's good news because this argument has sometimes been used as support for the existence of a creator and worse for the idea that we live in a multiverse. Let's have a look. The anthropic principle at first sight seems to simply be a tautologically true statement. We can only observe laws of nature that allow for the existence of observers. It sounds like a joke a five-year-old might make, but naive truths can be very revealing. The anthropic principle is not entirely useless because the observation that the universe is hospitable to life gives us constraints on the laws of nature. They need to be so that we can exist. The most famous use of the anthropic principle was when the physicist Fred Hoyle predicted the properties of the nucleus of the carbon atom. His argument was that life on Earth needs a lot of carbon, but carbon wasn't produced in sufficiently high amounts in the early universe. So where does it come from? It must be produced in stars by nuclear fusion. And this can only work if the carbon nucleus has a particular property which Hoyle predicted. And he was right. In all fairness, Hoyle's argument didn't have much to do with life in particular, but just generally with the observed abundance of some chemical elements. But in the end, it doesn't matter all that much just how physicists get their ideas, so long as they work. This is why I think using the anthropic principle is all well and good. But in the past decades, it's become connected with the multiverse, and that bothers me. The multiverse is the idea that there exists not just this one universe, but a large or even infinite number with different laws of nature. This raises the question, well, if there are so many universes, why do we live in this particular one? One way to approach this problem is to ask, what's the probability for life to arise in any of these universes, and how many observers inhabit each of them? in the entire lifetime of the universe. We're most likely to find ourselves in a universe that hosts a large number of observers. So if we find that the laws of nature in our universe are not optimal to produce observers, then that makes it unlikely the multiverse idea is correct. Just among you and I, I think that's nonsense. You can't stochastically sprinkle observers over universes like chocolate on a cake. That makes zero sense. But let's leave aside my misgivings. This is how the argument goes. Instead of laws of nature, one usually looks just at the known laws of nature and changes the constants. Then you calculate the probability for life to rise and observers to exist for each set of constants. And if you find that the constants in our universe are so that it's likely to contain a lot of observers, then that supports the multiverse. There have been a bunch of arguments that indeed the constants in our laws of nature are especially fine-tuned for life. But the results of this new paper say it's just not the case. They looked at the question of what value of the cosmological constant would be best for the emergence of life. The cosmological constant, lambda, is the simplest type of dark energy and it determines the expansion of the universe. It has a major influence on the rate of star formation and with that it strongly determines the probability for solar systems with planets that are hospitable to life. The cosmological constant plays such an important role because for stars to form, matter needs to clump. The larger lambda, the faster space expands and the harder it is for matter to clump, so there will be fewer stars. On the other hand, if the cosmological constant is very small, then matter clumps too well. That leads to a lot of big, large-scale structures with dense gas, but fewer star-forming regions. This means if you want solar systems with planets that can harbor life, the cosmological constant should be neither too small nor too large. In the paper, they calculate which is the optimal value and find that it's about 400 times larger than the one that our universe actually has. Consequently, our universe is not especially hospitable for life. As they write in the paper, the observed value of the cosmological constant appears to be unreasonably small compared to the predictions of the simplest multiverse ensemble. This poses a challenge for anthropic reasoning as a viable explanation for cosmic coincidence.
coincidences and the apparent fine-tuning of the universe. So can we conclude that the multiverse was falsified by evidence? Unfortunately not, because you can fix this problem by saying that the probability distribution of observers over the universes was somehow more complicated. And I'm afraid that's what theoretical physicists will do now. After 10 more years and several hundreds more papers, they'll conclude that the values of the constants of nature are what we already know they are. I can't wait. Somewhat more seriously, while there'll without doubt be some physicists who will continue working on this, I think this means that multiverse enthusiasm has peaked and will slowly decay from here on. Progress! Yay! To me, science is more than a profession. It's a way to understand the world and to solve problems. This is why I'm happy to work together with Brilliant, whose mission is to help you learn science in the easiest and most engaging way possible. All courses on Brilliant have interactive visualizations and come with follow-up questions. I found it to be very effective to learn something new. It really gives you a feeling for what's going on and helps you build general problem-solving skills. They cover a large variety of topics in science, computer science and maths, from general scientific thinking to dedicated courses on differential equations or large language models. And they're adding new courses each month. It's a fast and easy way to learn and you can do it whenever and wherever you have the time. Sounds good? I hope it does. You can try Brilliant yourself for free if you use my link brilliant.org slash Sabina. That way you'll get to try out everything Brilliant has to offer for full 30 days and you'll get 20% off the annual premium subscription. So go give it a try. I'm sure you won't regret it. Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow.